Well, the first thing that I would like to say on this topic is that the views you're going to hear me expressing are my own personal views. The churches of God do not have an official stance on the topics that we're going to be looking at in these series of four presentations. So I'm at liberty to give you, since you've asked for it, my personal view. And I will be at pains to make sure that that aligns very carefully with what's in Scripture. But I do want to make it clear that you're hearing what is my personal understanding of what the Word of God says on these particular issues. With that disclaimer, I'd like us to begin by reading Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, please. Where else would we begin? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The ten famous words with which the scripture opens. And so you could say the answer to the question is easy. How old is the earth? Well, it's been around since the beginning. The beginning that's spoken of in Genesis 1 and verse 1. And of course, that was the beginning of time as well as space. But I would think you are looking for an answer roughly in terms of years. And if that is so, you'll have to grant me the liberty, please, of some preamble as we approach that topic on the basis of the Word of God and in the light of the views of modern science. So, I want us to start then with what is the usual statement. The view that we would be confronted with if we are listening to a media report or if we were reading a school textbook or if we were reading a very academic scientific paper. We would be exposed to the view that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. Now, it has to be said straight away that this is not something that can be known directly. This is not like the Antiques Roadshow. You can't pick up a rock and turn it over and find there's a date stamped underneath it. Because humans were not around when the universe was created, and because it is a one-off event, then naturally we cannot know in any direct way how old the earth is. And essentially that's the point that the Lord himself made to the man Job in the scriptures. In Job chapter 38 and verse 4, the Lord asked the question, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? There was no human present. And therefore this is something we cannot know directly outside of the revelation of God's word. And that brings us to an important point that we might not readily register. And it is this, that there is a difference between operational science and origins science. In operational science... The scientists can perform experiments in the laboratory and can repeat those experiments and can verify the conclusions that he or she is coming to by repeated testing. There's no such luxury in origin science because we're talking about the origin of the universe and that's a singular event, it's a one-off event, it cannot be repeated at will and so we're in a different league a different type of science altogether. So among the things that I'd like us to consider in our preamble tonight as we approach this question, how old is the earth, are these. Are all kinds of science of the same type? We've already hinted the answer to that one. Can any scientist operate without faith in something or other? And which source of information is the one that we should trust most. And finally, if the Bible is true, 
What would we be expecting science to discover today? So we'll pass by some of these very basic issues that lie behind the topic that you've set us tonight. So, different kinds of science. Operational science versus origin science. If I can illustrate it this way, the astronomer who looks out into space receives light into his telescope and he makes the assumption that that light has been travelling at constant speed over millions or billions of light years in order to reach his telescope on Earth. And furthermore, that astronomer is assuming that the things that he can see in that light relate to events that took place millions or billions of years in the past. And furthermore, he's assuming that his explanation is the best possible explanation for these observations that he's making. And so you see that the scientist, the astronomer in this case, is confirming his or her worldview based on what he or she has already assumed. Based on what he or she already thinks they know about the world around them and how it began. So there are lots of assumptions there. And in origin science, inevitably, there are always going to be lots of assumptions that any scientist has to make. So you see, it's about a choice of worldview, a choice of how you look at the world. And every scientist has his or her own worldview. And many of them share the same, of course. But I want to emphasize the point that we are not talking about science on the one hand and faith on the other. Science and faith belong together. Can we do science without faith? I would say that we can't. First of all, here is the view of a theologian. And although it's couched in more elaborate language, it's really making the same point the Lord made to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? You weren't there, so you don't know how things were initially. So this theologian is saying that science is about discovering the laws that govern the universe. But the same science is incapable of discovering what the initial conditions were. Because no scientist was there. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? So assumptions have to be made about the initial conditions, how things were at the very outset. Now, a philosopher's point of view is like this. This philosopher says, science is the making of inferences based on observations, but within the framework of a theory. A scientist doesn't start with a blank sheet of paper. He or she has a theory in the back of his or her mind. And so doing science is the making of inferences, the drawing of conclusions on the basis of observations, but in terms of the framework of a theory that they bring to those observations. And finally, a scientist. We've had a theologian, a philosopher, now a scientist. And this scientist makes a fundamental point and he says that human reason can never operate outside of a framework of basic beliefs so this is not someone coming from a bible basis and saying this but here's a scientist speaking and saying that no scientist can employ reasoning without invoking a framework of basic beliefs. So you can't do science without some kind of belief, without some kind of way of looking at the world, and you're aiming to confirm your assumptions that you've already made. So let's look at some of the worldviews that scientists bring to their work, some of the beliefs that they have. 
This is a famous scientist, Richard Lewontin. He's a geneticist. He's an evolutionary biologist. A very brilliant person. And he says this. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. Why would he do that? Because, he says, we have a prior commitment to materialism. Why have this prior commitment to materialism? Because he said we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. So there's a framework of beliefs with which to start. And I want you to notice, if you delve into this, he's not saying that he's driven to this conclusion by inescapable logic based on hard facts. No, he's saying that his primary assumption, what he begins with, is a materialistic outlook. And because of that, he constructs scientific apparatus that will confirm, ultimately, that conclusion. And so there is faith influencing the final result. And it's a faith that there is no God, that everything can be explained in terms of materialism. And that's the reference framework for his science. That's his choice. Here's someone at a Christian college in the US and a, a biology and chemistry lecturer. And he says, I'm going to skip a little part of it uh, to put it in context, but he says, it's apparent that the most straightforward way of understanding the book of Genesis is to understand that God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And that humans were created on the sixth day. And that things proceeded until the fall of Adam and Eve. And then there was the catastrophic deluge that produced fossils at the time of the flood of Noah. So he says that's the most straightforward way to understand the book of Genesis, just as you read it. But that's obviously not how he personally interprets it. Why? He says, because of the inferences of science. He feels that science is so powerful and its views are so strong that he has got to come back to the text of Genesis and he's got to somehow rework it in order to account for the views that are coming across from science, such as we've just heard from Richard Lewontin. Now, thirdly, there's a man called Dr. Hartnett in Australia. He's an associate professor of physics at the University of Western Australia. And he nails his colours to the mast at the very beginning. He says, my worldview is based on the biblical truth that God the Creator created the universe about 6,000 years ago. It was not the result of an accident or any sort of big bang. He says, the worldview that underlies modern, secular or mainstream cosmology, that's the study of the origin of the universe, is an atheistic one. It has no place for a creator and only relies on what man can discover for himself. Fair enough. Human reasoning can never operate outside of a framework of basic beliefs. All scientists subscribe to that. They come with a different set of basic beliefs. And here's a man at the top of his game, very well respected, and he's nailing his colours to the mast, and he's saying, I take Genesis in a straightforward way, and I see no conflict with reinterpreting the observations of science to align with what's there in Scripture. You know, some people feel that science has done away with God. As science has increased in its knowledge and understanding, the need for God has, in some people's minds, diminished. We don't need that explanation so often. In fact, soon we'll be able to do away with that explanation at all, because science will be able to describe everything to us. Well, that's nonsense. Because if you were asked about the beginnings of the production of the motor car, 
mass-produced motor cars. You might say, well, it all comes down to the internal combustion engine. And somebody else might argue, no, 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 surely Henry Ford's got something to do with that. Well, you need both of those answers, don't you? The mechanism for explaining cars and their success is the mechanism of the internal combustion engine. But it needed the brilliance at that time of Henry Ford as the agent to see how it could be done and put into mass production. So we need both an agent and a mechanism. Science is about exploring the mechanisms of the workings of this wonderful universe. But in no way does that do away with the divine agent who is the creator of all things. Whose thoughts we are thinking after him as we explore the laws of science. As Professor John Lennox is wont to say, God is not a God of the gaps. He's the God of the whole show because he's the agent by which we can understand the mechanism that science involves itself with. Some take views, as we say, that are enlightened, as it were, by their own assumptions and worldview and beliefs. Professor Stephen Hawking is one such. Now, he's someone I would admire in many ways immensely, sitting in the chair of Sir Isaac Newton. And he's overcome so many obstacles, and what he's done is tremendous. But he's made a statement here that I think is frankly ridiculous. He says the universe created itself. I would submit that that's a basic flaw in logic. Because for something to create itself, it must at the same time both exist as doing the creating and also not exist because it's being brought into existence. How can something exist and not exist at the same time? How can something be green and not green at the same time? A basic child's logic would show that's impossible. So scientists are brilliant at science, but sometimes commit basic philosophical errors. What about Professor Richard Dawkins? We all know about him and his strong new atheistic views. And he was asked back in 2005 on a, a BBC Radio 4 programme on a Sunday morning, Richard Dawkins, is there anything, because of course he's wont to rubbish faith. Faith is for people who are weak in the head. And so he was asked, Professor Dawkins, is there anything that you believe but you cannot actually prove? And he was amazingly candid in the answer he gave on that occasion. He said, I believe, but I cannot prove that all life, all intelligence, all creativity, all design, in quotation marks, is the result, directly or indirectly, of Darwinian natural selection. I believe, he says, without being able to prove all scientists depend on faith, whatever their faith is in. Human reason cannot operate outside of a framework of basic belief. I'm emphasizing that because we can be so intimidated by the world of science as if what it pronounces is something that you can be totally 100% confident about on the basis of hard facts. Much of science is not like that. And when it comes to origin science, very little of it is like that. It's strongly influenced by people's personal beliefs and opinions, things they cannot prove. We've mentioned already Professor John Lennox, and he would be much closer to my position. He would take the view that God created the universe, of course, but that it was a long time ago with a conventional view of the age of the Earth and the universe. If I understand him correctly in what he's written, he would follow the line with cosmic and chemical evolution, but not biological evolution. And he would adhere to the days in Genesis being ordinary days, but not comprising in total an ordinary week, but rather spread out 
with great periods of time between them. And God having special interventions at different stages, such as the origin of life and the origins of humanity. An interesting viewpoint, one that perhaps some of you may share. And then there is the view that God created this world and the universe, and he did it recently, as a simple reading of the Bible might suggest. It's the plainest reading of the Bible, and it's that which causes the biggest challenge to the usual interpretation of modern science. But someone like Dr. John Baumgartner would take that view, and he's a scientist at the top of his game in plate tectonics, and his computer program is recognized as the world leader, and he would be consulted by NASA. So if it gives you any confidence, there are scientists at the top of their game respected worldwide and they hold to a plain reading of the word of God and a recent creation of this earth by God. So there are choices. I also wanted to comment on whether as you employ reason you allow it to be like the magistrate over scripture or you allow it only to act as the minister of scripture. Reason is something that we all need to use and the word of God would encourage us to use our reason. Come let us reason together, says God. And he's given us that reasoning faculty and we are to use it to the best of our ability within the parameters of God's word. So I'm suggesting to you it's good to use reasoning Good to use scientific reasoning at the very best level. But it should be dictated to by the word of God. And it itself should not be dictating how the word of God must be interpreted. So, let's think for a moment about some facts. The universe can't explain itself. Because its origin in scientific terminology is described as being a singularity. That means scientists can't explain it. It's a point where the laws of physics break down. It's unscientific. The Bible tells us about what happens in the first six days. And it says then God completed his creation. So the processes that God used according to scripture in those first six days are no longer being used and therefore the present is not the key to the past and the bible is in agreement with science that that very point of origin is inaccessible to us from a reasoning point of view we need to come to the revelation of god's word in the beginning god we must come back to that in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and Arno Penzias no less than a Nobel Prize winner says the science data that we have today is what we would expect if we only had the books of Moses <coughs> and he went on to say and if we only had in fact the whole Bible so there's a Nobel Prize winner and he's saying that the best scientific data today is actually what we would expect to find and discover based on an understanding of the Word of God. That's reassuring perhaps for some. I want us just to take a moment to think about God's general and special revelation. God's general revelation is in the universe around us, magnificent as it is. Psalm 19, verse 1 says, The heavens are declaring the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day after day pours out speech. God's majesty and glory is told out by the created universe in all its magnificence. But also, verse 7 of the same psalm introduces us to another book, not the book of nature now, but the written word of God. 
And if the book of nature is God's general revelation to us, this book is his special revelation to us. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now we should interpret the general by means of the special. It's a mistake to try to reinterpret the special, starting with the general. Because the special revelation of God, in the propositions that God's word gives us, they are so exact and these are so precise. And we would do well to seek to understand everything else in the light of them. And you know, the founders of modern science, from the time of the Reformation, that was their approach. What was it that gave a great impetus to science at that time? It was the return to the word of God by the reformers that gave people the idea that if there was a God and he's a God of order and a God of law, there are laws to be discovered in the universe. And so that's what gave science its impetus at that time. So we try to understand the general revelation of God in the book of nature through the special revelation of God in his written word. So we come to the days of creation. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. God saw that all that he had made. And behold it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And then we come into chapter 2 of Genesis. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all his works which God had created and made. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heavens. Now, I want you to notice there are three different usages of the word day in those scriptures. The first that we're drawing attention to is the daylight portion of a day. The second is a day of earth rotation. And the third day is a more general expression. The time at which God created the earth and the heaven. Now, I want you to compare a statement like this. Someone might have written, In my father's day, he would go to bed early Sunday evening and rise early in the morning of the following day and travel for the next six days during the day to cross the whole country. That's making the same three uses of the word day as the scripture does. In my father's day is a general time reference. And then there's reference to an earth rotation day. And then the daylight portion of such a day. What is the best way to understand Genesis chapter 1? Well, if I'm trying not to be too dogmatic to you tonight, I'm referring to a couple of scholars here. And... They are by no means ranked among those who have viewed the Bible most conservatively. But I think their testimony is all the stronger in this regard because of that. And in a private correspondence, Professor, the late Professor James Barr of Oxford, uh, of Old Testament literature and theology, said that he thought the literal 24-hour day was the most natural and sensible understanding of the biblical text. He spent his academic life devoted to a linguistic study of the Bible text, and that was his conclusion. Uninfluenced by any of the thoughts from science. And the liberal 19th century Professor Marcus Dodds said, if the word day in these days in Genesis chapter one does not mean a period of 24 hours, the interpretation of Scripture is hopeless. He's saying that that seems to be so clear that if we can't stand on that, 
then how can we convince people about lots of other things that are perhaps less clearly stated in the word of God? Now, having looked at the days, and if I was drawing your attention to the qualifiers that are there concerning those days, evening and morning, and in a sequential numerical sequence, there's no clear example in the whole of the Bible when that word is used in any other sense than an earth rotation day. But if we move on from that to the order of events in the Genesis account, some have wondered if they could accommodate the modern views. And that modern view is propounded through the media by people who say we are all recycled star stuff. One of the church fathers, interestingly, addressed that point long before. He said, on the fourth day, the luminaries, the sun, the moon, and the stars, came into existence. Since God has foreknowledge, he understood the nonsense of foolish philosophers who were going to say that things produced on earth had come from the stars, so that they might set God aside. In order, therefore, that the truth might be demonstrated, plants and seeds came into existence before the stars. For what comes into existence later cannot cause what is prior to it. So back in the earliest times, people were clear in their understanding of the order of Genesis. And they weren't about reordering them to fit with modern-day science, of course. This chart, I think, is an interesting one. It takes the conventional 4.6 billion years for the age of the Earth, but it condenses it into the span of a year, just so that we can get our head around it. And it says if you would make that comparison, then day one would be the day when the Earth was born, and it would be not until December the 31st that humans evolved, and it would even be in the evening of December the 31st. So right at the end of that whole span. But of course, according to the secular view, modern type humans have only been around for a hundred to at the very most 200,000 years. And over the span of 4.6 billion years, on a scale of scaling it all to one year, that brings humanity into existence just in the final hours of that year. But our Lord Jesus, when addressing a problem that was put to him, said, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now, to me that does not sit comfortably with any view that tries to accommodate the long time scale of secular modern science. From the beginning, God made them male and female. So, I would put it to you that there is therefore no room for any large gap anywhere between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 27 with the creation of male and female. What's more, if there were to be such a gap, then it would make the understanding of Romans 5 and 12 in the New Testament very difficult. Romans 5 and 12 says, Through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, for that all sin, death passed to all men, for that all sin. Now if you look at the modern way of looking at things, over all of this period before Humans were on the scene in December 31st. There was death and extinction. The so-called means of progression. Death before Adam. But the Holy Spirit's commentary through the New Testament apostles is that it was by Adam that sin and consequently death came. Death is the last enemy. Death is not natural. It was not God's means of creation. It was an enemy that came through the fall of man. That is the plain way of reading scripture. And theology of the New Testament depends, I suggest to you, on that reading of scripture. So we better just think about where that leads us to in terms of trying to date the earth. 
My preamble has been to establish that we have to do it by indirect methods. And I want you to think about a simple hourglass, a, an egg timer. And when you set it going, you would ensure, of course, that all the grains of sand were at the top. And then you would go about what you have to do. And while you're busy, the sand is flowing down into the bottom chamber. And so if it normally takes three minutes for all the sand to go from the top to the bottom, and if you came into the kitchen and you saw that sitting on the, the kitchen surface and there was half of the sand in the top and half in the bottom, you'd have said, ah, that has been operating for one and a half minutes because it's halfway through its cycle. But in order to draw a conclusion like that, you've had to make certain assumptions. You've had to assume that all the sand was in the top to start with. But remember, you've just entered the room when it's halfway through. You weren't there at the beginning. You don't know what the initial conditions were. You're assuming all the sand was in the top, or the salt, or whatever it was, to start with. You're also assuming that it's been running through at the rate that you have always known it to run through. It's not had the kettle boiling close by and the seal not very effective and some dampness has got in and clogged it up a little bit. You're discounting that. You're also assuming there has been no outside interference. When your back was turned, you're assuming little Johnny hasn't run into the kitchen and given it a bit of a ping and sent it spiralling round and reset it umpteen number of times. So, you have to make these assumptions. And in all I'm going to go on to talk to you about, these same three types of assumptions are made by scientists. Now, if landforms, if coal, if oil, if rocks and if fossils have all been known to form quickly, why do we have this persistent notion that all these things take millions upon millions of years? Well, the answer would be something known as dating the rocks by radioactive means. Some elements in nature are found to be unstable and a means of dating the rocks has been derived from that fact. Now, for a while the age of the Earth was anybody's guess, even in the scientific world. Lord Kelvin thought it might be 100 million years old. But in, in 1898, Marie Curie made a discovery. She discovered the phenomenon of radioactivity. The unstable atoms lose energy. Not all atoms are stable, some are unstable, and they would naturally decay. They would lose energy. They would emit radiation in the form of some kind of particles or some kind of waves of the general type that we associate light with. Now, it was in 1904 that a physicist, Ernest Rutherford, showed how this decay process that Marie Curie had discovered could actually be used like a clock in how to date the age of the rocks. Now, don't worry, it's in principle very simple. It's like the hourglass. It's like the egg timer. It's one thing changing into another. And that's all the scientists are measuring. As they start, they assume it started at least with uranium atoms, symbolized by the U, the chemical symbol for it. But over time, they are unstable and decay, and they become lead, or a form of lead. And so it's like the sand or the salt going from the top into the bottom. Uranium is changing into a form of lead. And if you know what was there at the beginning, but of course scientists can't, but if you make an assumption, and then you assume it's always changed at the same rate, just like the salt flowing, and if you assume that nothing else has interfered with this process, same three assumptions with the egg timer, if you make this assumption, then radioactive dating of the rocks can work. But it's always based on those assumptions. This is the so-called uranium lead method. Uranium decaying into a form of lead. Just compare it with the hourglass method and you've got the idea. 
And that's what scientists use. It's an indirect measurement. Now, a man called Arthur Holmes thought about how this could be used as a clock more carefully. And he was the one to actually develop the uranium lead method that we've just illustrated. And the best estimate for the Earth's age, the one that we've talked about, is based on radiometric dating of the type we've illustrated on fragments from the Canyon Diablo iron meteorite. So it's from a meteorite that they've worked out by this uranium lead method, the estimate for the age of the Earth. But you might say, why meteorites? That's the power of the story that a scientist employs. That's his worldview. He's looking to confirm assumptions. Patterson was someone who is considered to be the person who finally nailed the age of the Earth at 4.6 billion years old. But Patterson's evidence didn't come, as we see, from Earth rocks, but from iron meteorites. Remember that before you can come to your conclusion, before you can calculate the age for anything, you have to assume its history. You have to assume how it came about. And at the time Patterson was making his calculation, someone by the name of Chamberlain had put forward the idea that the Earth formed out of particles and rocks called planetesimals. And the meteorites were the leftover bits from the formation of the Earth. So it was quite justified to calculate the age of the Earth from the age of these iron meteorites. But you see how assumption is layered on top of assumption. It's assumptions about how the Earth formed as part of the theory of the formation of the solar system on top of all the assumptions from the hourglass type analogy that have to be applied to the uranium lead method. So that number calculated from the meteorite is still accepted today. And if you go to the geological survey sites in the US, you'll find it's still heralded as the best age for the Earth on the basis of those iron meteorites. Holmes, the one who developed the method, wasn't very enthusiastic. He said we should be using earth rocks, not meteorites. Fair point. But the consensus history of the earth is different now to what Patterson had assumed at the time that he made his calculation. But it's become the poster child of the age of the Earth, and it has remained in vogue, even referencing the meteorite from Canyon Diablo. So, assumption upon assumption, that's the only point that I'm striving to make. Now, it's important to know what we're told, but also important to know what we're not told. A lawyer can give a brilliant defence of a person, but suppose under cross-examination it comes out later that, yes, he had put the accused at the scene of the crime, but, oh, it was three weeks after the alleged crime had taken place. Oh, you didn't tell us that before. Well, it's important to understand what we're not being told about, for example, radiometric dating. There are many discordant results and carefully controlled experiments have been done to verify this. From the one set of rocks, from the one location, different radioactive dating methods were applied to the same rocks. And they gave a general answer of it being about a billion years old, on the basis of the assumptions they usually make, but there was a range of half a billion years. Such a variation, such discordant results. They were all over the place to the tune of half a billion years. Now, the pattern of variation in those results suggests something very interesting as a possibility that there could have been periods of accelerated radioactive decay in the past. That the assumption of a constant rate, which is the assumption of modern science, is not necessarily valid. And the discordant results give strong evidence that 
There have been times when the radioactive decay rate has been much faster in the past than it is now. And there's evidence of vast amounts of decay having taken place in a very short period of time. What is that evidence? Well, looking at some other rocks in New Mexico, certain tests were done. And using the standard method that we've illustrated, uranium changing into lead and the speed at which it does that and the standard assumptions, it was estimated that the rocks being sampled from a borehole were one and a half billion years old. But then, of course, it's known that uranium decays in eight stages to lead, essentially by the production of helium gas. And they were looking at the amount of helium gas that was left in the sample. And there was 58% of the expected helium gas still there. Now, after one and a half billion years, that's scarcely possible. You know how fast a helium birthday party balloon shrinks and goes down. Helium's a very slippery gas. It escapes so easily. Could 58% of that gas be still there after one and a half billion years? Well, the scientists checked the leaking rate of that gas. And they found that 58% remaining was consistent with an age of that rock of 6,000 years. So you've got two different clocks. And they're using the same type of scientific technique. Equally good science for both. Applying standard assumptions. One comes to an answer of one and a half billion. One comes to an answer of 6,000 years. You take your choice. The science is the same. You're choosing which assumptions you believe are valid. Now, there's other types of evidence that can assist you in the choice that you make, I suggest. I want to take you back to 1980, to Mount St. Helens in the US. After decades of inactivity, Mount St. Helens burst into life. And after some rumblings uh, from March of that year, by May of the year, there was the, the major eruption of Mount St. Helens. And the, the pictures you're viewing there show a before and after of that volcano. The top has been removed in the after picture. But what's most interesting is the picture down below. Layer upon layer of fine sediment was deposited in a very short space of time. If a geologist came 10 years later and looked at that without any prior knowledge, he or she would very likely say, that has been built up over millions of years. That's the standard interpretation of that kind of presenting evidence. But in this case, it took exactly three hours. And it was recorded as taking three hours. From 9 p.m. until midnight on June the 12th, 1980, people watched this happen. Eight meters of finely layered sediment, 25 feet scaled with a human at the foot of that. It doesn't always take the amount of time that we expect. And then, a couple of years later, in 1982, there was further rumblings, and there was a fresh flow of hot mud that breached its way through uh, snow and ice and other debris, and it gouged out a canyon. And it's a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon. And it took one day to form. And people watched it form in one day. And it looks, if we didn't know, that this would have taken millions of years by other observations that we would misapply to it. So all I'm saying is, things don't always take as long as standard interpretations would allow us to think. But what about those billions of light years and light coming to us from the edge of the universe? Well, if you grant me that the Earth is a very special place, not all scientists, of course, would at all agree with that, because they would take the view there are 100,000 million galaxies. 
And our Milky Way galaxy is just one of them. And it's pretty ordinary. And in our Milky Way galaxy, our star, the Sun, is just one of 100,000 million stars. And it's a pretty average star. And we're on this little bit of rock that goes round this average star in a nondescript galaxy among 100,000 million of them. What's special about the Earth, the scientists would say? We're only asking the question because by some fluke we're here to ask it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the Earth. That makes the Earth a very special place in God's revelation. And if you grant that, And if you also grant me that space is expanding, the universe is expanding, yes, that's a standard view in science, but it's also based on the Word of God. Isaiah and other places will talk about God stretching out the expanse of the heavens. And we observe that by a normal interpretation of modern science. And also if you grant me the the mathematics of Einstein. He did something very special um, almost a hundred years ago. He he said that if we accept that the speed of light is the same for everyone, then time can be very different for different people. That doesn't seem very natural to us. Time no longer being absolute. But this is the standard view of science. And Stephen Hawking has spoken about black holes. And someone who is just about to fall into a black hole. And he's got a clock on display. And as you look at his clock from some very distant space observatory. You see that his clock is slowing down to a standstill. It's the effect of the intense gravitational field of a black hole upon time itself. And time in the space lab is running so much faster compared to that clock. Clocks at different places, running at vastly different rates. Now, if you grant me Earth is special, if you grant me that the universe is expanding, and if you grant the ideas of Einstein, then wouldn't it be perfectly possible to conceive of God creating our universe in such a way that billions of years could have elapsed at the edge of the universe in what only took six days of Earth's time to accomplish. So in summary, I want to pull the last three strands together. I would say there has been billions of years worth of radioactive decay. I would say there has been billions of years worth of geological activity. There has been starlight travel over billions of light years But God doesn't require our accustomed timescales to achieve and accomplish that. A common misconception regarding so-called carbon dating is this. That it supports a very old age for the earth. Wrong. Carbon dating can only be used to date things that are thousands, not millions of years old. Oh, well, if it could only date things that are just thousands of years old, then it won't be any good for dating fossils, will it? Or coal. Or oil. Or diamonds. Wrong again. Because measurable amounts of the radioactive form of carbon has been found in all of the above. Which seems to suggest they are not as old as people think. And there are other ways of coming to the same conclusion that things are not as old as we're usually told. The rates of the erosion of the continents of the world, the rate of accumulation of salt in the oceans, the recession of the moon from the earth, the rate of decay and dissolution of comets that go past the sun where they would melt up in a short time. And if the earth and the universe is so old, why are they still there? All of these things suggest a young age for the earth. So finally, 
I'm encouraging you to select your date for the age of the earth based on your worldview. And I'll select mine based on the word of God. I would recommend that we avoid making confident conclusions on the basis of flimsy assumptions. And anyone could be guilty of doing that, but very usually scientists can do that. And I would also say, as supported by some scientists that we've mentioned, who we've said are at the top of their game, there is no hard evidence against what a plain Bible reading indicates in what it might infer to us about the age of the earth. And that young age for the earth, as we have just lately seen, might even be favoured by reasonable assumptions in place of the usual standard assumptions that scientists make. So, to conclude, because it seems fitting in the week that has celebrated the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the Wittenberg Cathedral door and sparking off the Reformation, what did Luther say? Well, he said this, when Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days. But if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honour of being more learned than you are. Words from Martin Luther. So, with that, and just about on time, let's draw to a conclusion. Thank you for your patience in listening to so much. I hope it's given you something to think about. Shall we pray?